It is absolutely impossible to study anatomy and physiology without also having some understanding of basic chemistry. Certainly the human body is made up of many different chemicals that are cellularly and environmentally derived and that interact with one another in a vast variety of ways. An understanding of basic chemistry is crucial to appreciate the importance of water, proteins, carbohydrates, and ATP to human life. While this module will present some basic chemistry, throughout this course we will repeatedly return to the basics of chemical structure, interaction, and function. Chemistry is the branch of science that deals with the identification of the substances of which matter is composed, the investigation of their properties and the ways in which they interact, combine, and change, and the use of all these processes to form new substances. Matter is anything that occupies space and has mass. Mass is the amount of matter in an object. For practical purposes, mass is measured as weight. Technically, mass is constant and weight is variable. Weight results from gravity acting on mass. Therefore, even though someone's mass remains constant, if they were on the moon, where the force of gravity is only one-sixth of that on Earth, they would weigh less. Matter exists in three states, solid, liquid, and gas. Solids have a definite shape and a definite volume. Liquids have a definite volume but conform to the shape of its container. And gases have neither definite shape nor a definite volume. Energy, however, has no mass and does not take up space. We measure energy based upon its effect on matter. Indeed, energy is defined as the capacity to do work or put matter in motion. We will pay special attention to the use and creation of chemical energy. Substances are chemically held together by what are called chemical bonds. When these bonds are broken, energy is released and drives chemical reactions or puts matter in motion. Anabolic reactions combine simpler structures into more complex ones. Energy is temporarily stored in the bonds of these complex structures. A substance known as adenosine triphosphate or ATP is said to have significant potential energy stored within its bonds. When its bonds are broken, its critical energy is released. As we continue in this course, we will further explore ATP's critical role in human physiology. All matter is composed of elements. Elements are unique substances that cannot be broken down into simpler substances by ordinary chemical methods. Presently, there are 118 known elements. 92 of these elements occur naturally, and the remainder are artificially made. Elements have been organized by property and structure on a chart known as the periodic table. The names of the elements on the periodic table are abbreviated using one or two letters. 98.5% of the elements in the body include hydrogen, carbon, oxygen, calcium, and phosphorus. The remaining 1.5% include about 15 different elements. It should be noted that although the percentage of other elements may be small, these elements are indeed crucial to maintenance of normal human function. For instance, as we move forward in this class, we will explore the importance of sodium, chlorine, and potassium in the nervous and muscular systems. The basic building block of an element is an atom. 
atoms of each element are distinct and unique. Indeed, elements are identified by the structure of their unique atoms. The anatomy of an atom includes a nucleus that contains positively charged protons and neutrons that do not carry a charge. The nucleus is surrounded by what is called an electron cloud. Electrons are tiny, negatively charged particles that surround and are electrically attracted to the nucleus. The nucleus of the atom accounts for 99.9% .9 of its mass. Protons and neutrons have roughly equal mass designated as atomic mass units. Though the electron's negative charge is equal in strength to protons, the electron's mass does not significantly contribute to the atom's overall mass. Now, the number of protons determine the element. Each element has a distinct number of protons. The number of protons is designated on the periodic table as the atomic number. In atoms, the number of protons always equals the number of electrons. Therefore, atoms do not carry a net charge. Atoms are electrically neutral. Another way elements are identified is with a preceding sub and superscripted number. The superscript number represents the mass number. The mass number is the number of protons and neutrons contained within the nucleus. The subscript number represents the atomic number, which is the number of protons in the nucleus. You probably noticed the number on the periodic table just below the element symbol. This number represents the atomic weight. You probably also noted that this number differs slightly from the mass number. That's because there exists different versions of the same element. These versions are identified by differing number of neutrons. When an element has a different number of neutrons, they are referred to as that element's isotopes. Since the number of protons remains the same, the atom has not changed and the element is constant. However, because of the change in neutrons, it has a slightly different atomic weight. The atomic weight represents the average weight of the element and all of its isotopes. Most elements have at least two isotopes. Atoms rarely exist in isolation. They are often found physically interspersed with other substances or chemically bound to other elements, or a combination of both. A mixture is defined as two or more substances that are physically intermixed, but not chemically bound to one another. The substances can therefore be separated with relative ease. A toss salad is an example of a mixture. In chemistry, there are three major types of mixtures. Solutions, colloids, and suspensions. The components of solutions include a solvent and a solute and can be either gases, liquids, or solids. The solvent is the substance present in the greatest amount and the solute are the substance or substances in the smaller amount. Solutions are said to be homogeneous, meaning that the particles spread out evenly throughout the solution so it does not matter where you take a sample, the contents will be the same whether you take it from the top, middle, bottom, or anywhere within the solution. Because the solutes do not scatter light, solutions are transparent. We will review the properties of water and its importance in sustaining life. Many substances necessary for life are found in the body in solution, 
with water serving as the critical solvent. Colloid mixtures are heterogeneous. This means that the particles do not scatter evenly throughout the mixture, but they do not settle out. Colloid particles tend to scatter light, and therefore colloids are typically milky or translucent. The particles in suspensions are visible. The particles can settle out and scatter light, and suspensions are therefore translucent. Suspensions are heterogeneous, meaning that the particles do not scatter evenly throughout the mixture. A good example of a suspension in the human body is the elements of blood. Blood is made up primarily of plasma, which is made up mainly of water. Suspended in the plasma are platelets, red blood cells, and white blood cells. So once again, atoms rarely exist in isolation. If not simply physically intermixed, they exist in combination with the same or different atoms and are chemically bonded to one another. When chemically bonded together, these atoms are collectively known as compounds. The basic unit of a compound is called a molecule. For the most part, compounds are formed by the interaction between the electrons of individual atoms. As you recall, the nucleus of the atom contains protons and neutrons. Protons are positively charged and neutrons do not carry a charge. Therefore, the nucleus is positively charged. The nucleus is surrounded by an electron cloud. Electrons are negatively charged. In atoms, the number of electrons always equals the number of protons. Therefore, atoms are electrically neutral. Electrons exist in the cloud in regions known as electron shells or energy levels. The amount of potential energy electrons have is based upon their proximity to the nucleus. Electrons that exist in energy levels close to the nucleus have less potential energy, meaning the positive attraction force of the nucleus exerts greater influence on these electrons, holding them in the energy level. The electrons further from the nucleus have more potential energy because the nucleus exerts less attractive forces. Now each energy level holds a maximum amount of electrons. Shell 1, the energy level closest to the nucleus, holds a maximum of two electrons. Shell 2 holds a maximum of eight. And shell 3 holds 18 electrons. Subsequent shells may hold an increased number of electrons. Energy levels fill consecutively, meaning that one shell must be completely filled before the next shell receives electrons. When the outer energy level is full or contains at least eight electrons, the atom is considered stable, meaning that under normal circumstances, the atom will not combine with another atom. One way atoms form compounds is by losing or gaining electrons. Compounds are formed by the interaction of electrons in the valence or outermost electron energy level, the levels with the most potential energy. Ionic bonds between atoms occur when valence electrons are attracted away from one atom and received by another. Let's take the interaction of sodium, a powdery metal, and chlorine, a green toxic gas. 
sodium has an atomic number of 11, meaning it has 11 protons and electrons. Chlorine has an atomic number of 17. Therefore, sodium has 2 electrons in shell 1, 8 in shell 2, and 1 in its valence shell. Chlorine has 2 in shell 1, 8 in shell 2, and 7 in its valence shell. We already know that atoms are more stable if their valence shells are full or have at least 8 electrons within them. When sodium and chlorine are close together, sodium valence electron is attracted to the more positive attraction of the chlorine atom and moves from its valence energy level to the chlorine's valence energy level. Though the sodium valence level is now full, sodium now has one less electron. Similarly, the chlorine valence energy level is now full, but now chlorine has one extra electron. The atoms are now known as ions. Sodium has a net positive charge, one less electron. Ions with positive charges are called cations. Chlorine has a net negative charge, one extra electron. Ions with net negative charges are called anions. The two ions are now attracted to one another and joined to make a totally different and distinct substance known as sodium chloride, normal table salt. Most ionic bonds form substances known as salts. Ionic bonds are relatively weak. They do not require extraordinary chemical means to break. Electrons can interact with one another by sharing valence electrons. When electrons between atoms are shared, they are bonded together in what is called covalent bonds. Let's take water for an example. Oxygen has eight electrons, two in shell one, and six in its valence shell. Once again, atoms are most stable when the valence energy level is full. Oxygen is therefore more stable if it has two additional electrons. Hydrogen has only one electron in its valence shell and requires one additional electron to be stable. Two hydrogen atoms share their valence electrons with oxygen forming H2O or water. The oxygen valence shell is temporarily filled as well as the hydrogen atom. Covalent bonds are much stronger than ionic bonds. Water is said to be held together by polar covalent bonds or is a polar molecule. The angle in which the hydrogens attach to the oxygen and the fact that the electrons spend more time around the oxygen set up polar charges on opposite ends of the molecule. The oxygen part of the molecule is more negative and the hydrogen end is more positive. Rather than chemical bonding two or more atoms, weak hydrogen bonds, more like electrical attractions, often form between hydrogen atoms bonded to another atom by polar covalent bonds and a more negative portion of another molecule. Hydrogen bonds are not strong enough to chemically bond atoms. However, they play an important role in holding molecules together or maintaining the distinct shape of certain molecules. In the displayed picture, the purple dots represent hydrogen bonds forming between the hydrogen end of one water molecule and the oxygen end of another. These hydrogen bonds are responsible for at least two important properties of water.
Water is a compound that is crucial to life. In fact, under some conditions, humans cannot be deprived of water for more than three days before life is significantly threatened. Most living cells are comprised of between 60 and 80 percent water. It is indeed the unique properties of water that makes it so crucial to life. One critical attribute is water's adhesive properties. That is, water's ability to stick to other surfaces. Because of its polar nature, the hydrogen end is attracted to negative portions of molecules and oxygen to the more positive portions of molecules that line body cavities and even cover the skin. Water, then, is able to cover these surfaces and facilitate friction-reduced sliding movements and play critical physiological roles. If adhesion is the ability of water to stick to other surfaces, cohesion is the ability of water to stick to itself. The hydrogen bonding between water molecules are responsible for this cohesion. This cohesion is what makes rain fall in droplets and water to present in sheets. In the human body, cohesion contributes to water's ability to contain substances deposited in it. It contributes to the ability to keep substances in solution. For example, many substances are dissolved and contained in blood. Blood is primarily made up of plasma, which is primarily made up of water. It is water's cohesion that helps contain the many substances dissolved or contained in plasma. Water is thermally stable. It absorbs and releases a large amount of energy before it changes temperature. This property significantly contributes to the body's ability to maintain an internal temperature of 98.6 degrees Fahrenheit or 37 degrees Celsius regardless of internal physiological or external environmental changes. Associated with thermal stability is water's high heat of vaporization. When water changes from a liquid to a gas, large amounts of heat must be absorbed. This is crucial to how the body cools itself. Perspiration, which is made up primarily of water, adheres to the skin and then evaporates, removing heat from the body. A combination of its polarity and cohesive properties contribute greatly to water's solvency. Indeed, because of the many substances that can be contained by and dissolved in water, it is referred to as the universal solvent. The polar nature of water contributes to the dissociation of ionically bonded salts when placed in water. Because of their molecular structure and polarity, some molecules or some parts of molecules are hydrophilic or water-loving, while others are hydrophobic or water-fearing. These influences also enhance the solvency properties of water. Finally, water is an important reactant in many chemical reactions. Many molecules can be broken into simpler substances by the addition of a water molecule. This is known as hydrolysis. Also, large molecules can be combined through the removal of water molecules. This is known as dehydration synthesis.